Firstly, I would like to state that I am an atheist, and tend to remain skeptical when it comes to the supernatural or paranormal. But there have been a handful of events that have occurred in my life that science or rational thoughts can't explain. One such moment occurred in July of this year. For context, I am a 23 year old man, originally from the north of England. But now, I'm currently living in the West Midlands. During the events of this experience, I was house sitting with my boyfriend. They had quite a large amount of land, and were in the middle of nowhere. And by nowhere, I mean in the middle of a forest, on top of a hill, surrounded by peaks and caves. Our friend and her husband had gone on holiday. But due to having quite a lot of land, and a very large and ostentatious home, and a lot of animals to look after, we were invited to house it. I didn't mind though, as I already live in the countryside, and because of my boyfriend's work I usually am home alone, so I don't mind the isolation much. I imagined it would be fun to explore the woods, play with the animals on the farm and even go explore the caves nearby, as they were full of ruins and cave houses that were built during the Bronze Age or something. We were staying in the guest house, and were tasked with making sure the gardens were looked after, the yards were kept clean, and the house itself was secure, and that the six horses, five geese, and two farm cats were all looked after. Despite it being a lot of work cleaning up after the horses, and just generally looking after the place, we were enjoying ourselves taking time to swim in the pool and binge watching Netflix. However, my boyfriend has recently been promoted and was unfortunately called into work for the last few days of the week. He tried to make sure that he helped me with all the jobs before he left in the afternoon. But on Friday, I had to do the afternoon chores all by myself. So after feeding horses, I put the geese back into their shed, making sure they had water and food, when I noticed the two farm cats acting very strange. Harry and Jack, despite being tough farm cats, had the nicest disposition ever. They were really friendly, but now they were stood by one of the biggest gates on the yard, hissing at the bolted and locked wooden gate. Then suddenly they stopped hissing and climbed back into their little wooden house, seemingly for the night. After locking the geese in their hut and making sure it was secured against the local fox, I went over to the big yard gate. I tried to peep through this massive barbed wire gate to see if there was anyone outside, but there was nothing there. In truth, I didn't expect to see anyone because the house itself was in the middle of the forest and hills. Pretty much, I was in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest village was a 20 minute drive away. I just chalked the cat's odd behavior up to a naughty fox trying to sneak in, but I couldn't help but feel a little on edge. After giving the cats food and water, I locked them in their cool little cat house, just to make sure they wouldn't be brawling with the local fox or other wildlife. Once I did that, I did one last check of the horses in the fields. So I hiked up the hill. And whilst checking on the two mares, I got this odd sensation like someone was watching me. I would have chalked it up to paranoia. But suddenly the two mares let out shrill cries and bolted. I felt both confused and worried, as the normally very placid mares rushed out of the field and hid inside their shelter. If that wasn't weird enough, things only grew more troubling. When I made my way back down through the fields, I discovered all the horses were doing the same. The big, boisterous stallion Saxon was hiding within his field shelter 
and the little family, a trio of horses comprised of a mare foal and male horse, had also taken a hiding in their shelter at the far end of their field. This was really weird. I had spent every hour of the day for a week observing these animals and looking after them. They'd never acted like this before. I even considered calling my boyfriend back, but couldn't help but feeling like I was overreacting. As I finished tidying the yard, I switched on the electric fences and made my way back to the guest house. It was getting cold and it was somewhat soothing. We had experienced a week of scorching weather, so a little breeze and shade was actually quite relaxing. But the breeze turned to a gale and grey clouds grew above me and went black in an instant. And I remember feeling really uneasy as I looked up at the suddenly tempestuous skies. The heavens then unleashed and I rushed off down the garden path back to the guest house, which was situated next to the electronic gate and just across from the main house. I suddenly felt a lot safer. And then I thought to myself, safer? Safe from what? I had no idea why I was freaking out so much. I told myself to stop being stupid and kept telling myself people of my age shouldn't get worked up over nothing. So I opened the guest house door and proceeded to tidy up the wheelbarrows away and lock up the garage, which was handily connected to the side of the guest house with its roof sheltering me from the rain. Then a rather nasty wind whipped down through the path leading up to the garden, startling not just me, but all the birds who were nesting in the bushes at the time. Their unexpected and frantic screeching was enough for me. I slammed the garage door shut, locking it quickly and scrambled back into the guest house. Now all the time we had been staying there, we had never locked the door to the guest house. I guess we felt safe behind the high walls and electronic gates. I see now that we were foolish to think so. Yet something about tonight made me want to lock that door. Perhaps it was because of the weather or the strange behavior of the animals. Or maybe it was the notion that my boyfriend, the only person who knew I was out there and who could help me, wouldn't be back until three in the morning. Regardless, something about tonight made me feel like the simple wooden door and its easily smashable glass windows were all the protection I had. So I locked the door from the inside and kept the keys in my pocket. Sitting down on the sofa, I turned on the television and began to watch my favorite soap opera to take my mind off my irrational fears. However, Every now and again, my eyes would veer away from the television and gaze out of the three very large windows, looking out across the gravelly front yard and the distant rain drenched garden. I didn't know why I kept looking out of the windows, but in hindsight, I think it was my instincts telling me to do so, to keep a watch because something was coming. Evening turned to night and I let out a tired yawn as I watched as the lights around the yard automatically came on. I looked out past the kitchen and out the glass on the door to see the patio light turn on just as it had always done. I know it seems silly, but the idea of being surrounded by light made me feel safe. Nothing can hide in the light and it seemed like the light was able to banish all bad things, all the bogeymen in closets, all the monsters onto the bed. It could even get rid of nightmares. And now I was safe, surrounded by my lights. How stupid was I? A loud knock rapped upon the guest house door, almost causing me to jump out of my skin. I looked over to the door but the patio light had gone out and made it difficult to see anything. Feeling rather frightened, I turned the television off and looked out the living room window to check 
that the electronic gates were still shut, which they were. I kept thinking maybe my imagination had gotten the better of me, and that my fear had just made me believe I had heard the knock at the door. However, any doubt I had was washed away as a second, more firmer knock rattled across the glass on the door. Utter disbelief took hold, and I could feel myself leave my body. That's how shocked I was. I mean, this isn't a street in the middle of an estate. This was the middle of nowhere. For a moment, I sat there listening to the rain drumming on the window of the guest house, and with a deep breath, I stood up, stepping towards the kitchen and the front door. To my shock and surprise, on the other side of the glass on the door, were two young boys. They looked to be about 12 to 14, and the dark hoodies that they wore were sodden from the rain, as if they had been standing out there the entire night. They looked cold and pale, and a surge of humanity and compassion swept over me, causing me to almost commit a massive mistake. I rushed over to the door and went to open it, fearing that the children may be injured or lost. But then, it suddenly dawned on me. Where did they come from? How did they get in without me opening the electronic gates? I slowly withdrew my hand from the opening, and the two boys looked up towards me from behind the glass, their face still shrouded behind their hoods. Please let us in. We went for a walk and got lost in the woods. The taller and more mature of the two boys spoke. His words seemed more calculating and smooth than that of a child. We're lost and cold, the small boy whimpered. His words pulled on my heartstrings, and I did feel really worried for them. But then, I once again reminded myself this wasn't possible. So I summed up all my courage and all my breath and asked, the two children a question. Where did you come from? How did you get in here? The gate was open. We saw the lights were on and rushed over. Please can we come in out the cold? We just want to call our parents. They'll be worried sick. The taller boy exclaimed, with his well composed words leering me towards the door. Again, I found myself believing the words of the more mature boy, and I almost believed his explanation before I suddenly realized the gates had been closed since my boyfriend had left. Only we were in possession of the remotes used to open them, and I knew they hadn't opened. You're lying. The gate's been shut all night. I never even saw you come in. So where did you come from? The two young boys looked at each other. And then what happened next sent shivers down my spine. They turned their heads to look behind them. And there, down the garden path, was an even taller boy, emerging from the darkness. His long, slender form seemed to drift through the bushes and trees that hung over the little pathway. Like the others, he was wearing a dark hoodie and his spindly hands were cold, white. What little I could see of his face looked just like the two smaller boys, pale and ghostly. I shuddered, and the whole kitchen went cold. I could literally see my breath, and I felt more terror from these three young boys than I've ever felt before from anything else. I know it seems crazy. But there was something about their voices and their near identical clothing. It just wasn't normal. It was like they were trying to appear as normal and human as they could, but lacked the sense of identity and uniqueness that all humans have. As the older boy approached, I realized he was as tall as me and stood between the two haunting children. I stepped back. Please let us in. It's cold and dark, 
and we're frightened, the taller boy said. Weirdly, his voice still sounded young and partially childlike, but it didn't seem normal. I stepped back a little further. Come on, Connor. Let us in. We can't come in unless you say it's okay. The older and more dominating of the three boys called out. My eyes widened with disbelief. I felt my whole body shiver with fear, and my heart threatened to stop as I let out a gasp. How could they know my name? That's impossible. This sort of stuff doesn't happen in real life, and hoping that this was all some sort of hallucination or my imagination gone wild, I closed my eyes for a moment and hoped that when I opened them again, they would be gone. But when I did, they were still there. Get out of here, I'm gonna call the police, I yelled, with my words not carrying any sort of strength. They wouldn't get here in time. You're in the middle of nowhere. You're all alone with us. The two small boys giggled. Their hideous giggling and heinous laughter sent fear rocketing through me. I could feel my eyes filling with tears and terror consumed me. They kept laughing and they kept cackling and giggling. Their teeth were as black as charcoal. Go away. Leave me alone, I cried out. But the boys suddenly stopped laughing and pushed their faces up against the glass on the door. Their eyes. Their eyes were black. I couldn't even scream. I couldn't move. And I now knew these three phantoms were not children. Whatever these creatures were, with their eyes like midnight and their festering grins, they were not human. And worse than that, they were thoroughly enjoying terrorizing me. You're going to die in there, the smaller boy giggled. At that, I let out a yelp and ran into the living room. I slammed the kitchen door shut and pushed one of the living room chairs up against it. I kept fearing that the simple wooden door would not keep them out, and staggered back towards the bedroom. But I could still hear them giggling and taunting me. I could feel my heart thumping, and the sense of fight or flight was taking hold. But I couldn't fight whatever those things were, and I couldn't run away either. Where would I go if I somehow escaped into the woods? I dreaded to think what else could be lurking out there. But what if I managed to get to the horse fields? Would I be safe with them? I doubted it. And what if I was outside, and there were more than just three? As I wrestled with my chances and choices, I suddenly realized I couldn't hear them anymore. My eyes caught a glance of something pale, and I saw them standing on the other side of the living room windows. Each of the three children was stood in front of one of the three large windows, grinning at me. I wanted to run over and shut the blinds, but my feet felt like they were glued to the floor. And when I finally felt movement return to me, I ran for the bathroom, the only room in the guest house with a lock. I locked myself inside and sat in the shower with the lights off, hoping they would just leave. As I laid there, praying to every god, angel, demon and deity I could think of, but none of them answered my call. It was like the boy said, I was alone. For hours I stayed there listening to the boys as they continued to yell, let us in. Let us in. It seemed like it would never end, until it suddenly and abruptly did. I couldn't hear them anymore, and after half an hour of silence, I summoned up what courage I had left and peeked out of the bathroom. The boys were gone from the living room window, so seeing my chance, I ran over and shut the blinds. 
and I wondered if they were back at the front door. So again I took a deep breath and pushed the chair aside and opened the kitchen door. They weren't there anymore, and the patio light was on again. They were gone. However, I took no relief from their disappearance, for even though I knew they were gone physically, I couldn't help but feel as though they were still lurking somewhere down in the garden path, watching me from the shadows, waiting for me to let my guard down and jump out to begin the terrorism anew. For the rest of the night, I sat up with all the lights on and a big kitchen knife in my hand, waiting for my boyfriend to come back. When morning came, I heard the gates open. My eyes were heavy, and I was exhausted. But that sound filled me with a wave of energy. I rushed over to the front door, unlocking it, and sprinted over to him. In a frantic ramble, I tried to tell him what had happened. And despite him saying he believed me, I couldn't see he did. Why would he? I was on edge for the rest of my time there. I couldn't sleep properly, and every time we were back on the fields or in the garden, I could sense their eyes on me. The following day, nothing happened, and the owners returned. I wanted to tell them what I had experienced, as they were good friends of ours, but didn't want to freak them out or sound crazy, so I kept it to myself. As we had breakfast with them, one of the owners, Steph, told us how much of a good job we'd done and asked if we'd enjoyed it, which I replied with a reluctant yes. Her mood changed and her eyes looked worried as she asked if there were any problems. I assumed by problems she meant with the animals. And when I told her the animals were all great, she looked at me and asked if anyone tried to break in. I could feel what she was about to say before she even said it, and I knew I didn't want to hear it. I would prefer my experience with those boys to just be a hallucination or the onset of madness, but I knew from the look in her eyes that she was going to tell us otherwise. Steph said the last few times they went on holiday, they would come home and find footage on their CCTV of three boys knocking at the door late at night and calling for someone to be let in. They had the police search the grounds and the surrounding area, but there were no signs of a break-in. In truth, there were no signs that the boys even existed. I told her about my experience, and she seemed genuinely unnerved. And my boyfriend, who is as skeptical as they come, apologized for not believing me. They asked if we would ever house sit for them again, and I, without hesitation, said no. I never want to cross paths with those strange boys and their midnight eyes. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if it had not been me in the guest house, but someone more trusting. I wonder what might have happened had I let them in. I imagine I would not be here to write this account had I done so. I don't know who or what they are, or where they came from. All I know is that they weren't normal. They're real. And I will never forget my visitation from the black eyed children. This happened when I was in high school roughly 2000 to 2004. I had woken up at around 4am with a knocking on my window. I could hear the low hum of a car idling, and I went to the window and peeked through the blinds. There was a girl's face. Even though my window was closed, I could hear her speak clearly. Is Nick home? That's my brother. Since it was a girl asking for my brother, I instantly thought it was his girlfriend and my brother used to come home really late at night, or early morning, depending on your perspective, and I didn't know if he was home or not, and told her I would go check. I went to my brother's room and he wasn't there. I returned to the window, and since I thought it was my brother's girlfriend who I knew, I raised the blinds all the way up to this point. 
but it wasn't his girlfriend. My brother's girlfriend is tall and has blonde hair. This girl was short, had black hair and a ponytail, and I could see a car in the driveway too, which is what I was hearing. I told her he wasn't home, and she seemed nervous, and said to herself, Nick, where are you? I told her that he hadn't come home yet, and she walked away. I closed the blinds and went back to sleep, and laid in bed thinking about it. I didn't ever recall seeing the girl's eyes. It didn't occur to me in my half-sleepy state as I was speaking to her, but upon reflection, it seemed to me like her eyes were missing. I told my brother about her the next day, and he seemed to have no idea who it could have been. He could have been lying because my brother has been known to cheat on his girlfriend, so it could have been a cover-up. I know I wasn't dreaming, because this felt so real, and I've never had a dream like this before. Could it have been a black-eyed kid? But it did seem weird that she didn't appear to have eyes. Another thought occurred to me. I can't remember the exact time, but one of my brother's past girlfriends passed away in a terrible accident when she was underneath a jacked up mobile home cleaning underneath it, when it fell and crushed her. They were broken up at the time. Perhaps it was her phantom coming back to say goodbye one last time. Not to mention my brother's ex-girlfriend had short black hair and tended to wear ponytails. I was 19 when this happened. I live in Chicago, Illinois. My family and I used to rent an apartment in the McKinley Park neighborhood. Our tenants were at the time family members. My then aunt was nine months into her pregnancy and on that day, her water broke. There was limited space in the two family cars, and the rest of my family went with her to the hospital, which was only a 15 minute drive from their current location. I volunteered to stay back, as I had the house all to myself. It was a two story house, two separate apartments, and the basement which was fully furnished. The layout is complex to describe, because the winding staircase that leads from the first floor to the basement is located in the first floor's kitchen. At the bottom landing to the right, immediately following the landing is a laundry room and an adjacent half bathroom. If you follow the corridor leading straight in front of the staircase, there's another room to the right, a bedroom belonging to my, at the time, uncle. Past that, there is a large room, a recreation room, with space for a mini bar, a pool table, a set of weights, and a small cot or bed. This is relevant because as soon as my family left for the hospital, I headed downstairs to do some exercise. I went downstairs and I sat by the set of weights, loaded them, and got in position to start bench pressing. I did about three sets before it hit the fan. It started off very subtly. I was ripping out a set of bench presses when I heard the unmistakable creak of someone walking down those old winding steps from the staircase that leads from the kitchen on the first floor to the basement. I instinctively called out my sister's name, thinking that she'd come back. Nothing. After listening attentively for a few seconds, I convinced myself that it was just the house settling, and I resumed my exercise. I got halfway through a set when I heard it again. This time, I was sure I wasn't hearing things. I got up and cautiously walked to the landing of the winding staircase, and I made my way up slowly. It creaked beneath my feet. I'm not a big guy. Five at seven and at the time I weighed an underwhelming 150 pounds, but I was and continue to be very strong and agile, but I was unnerved a bit. I walked around the entire first floor to make sure I was alone and no one had returned or worse broken in. Before I made my way upstairs to check the first floor, 
I checked all the rooms in the basement except the bedroom. It was always kept locked, and this time was no exception. As I headed back down from checking the first floor, the door was wide open. Typically, this bedroom had a bed, two nightstands, a TV, and a walk-in closet. None of these were there. The room was completely empty, and I felt I was in a trance. In the middle of the room was a familiar little girl. It was my sister, except this couldn't be her. This girl looked like my sister when she was 11, with long bangs. My sister is older than me by two years. She's 21 now. But there she stood in front of me, looking 11. But her eyes... Her eyes had no whites, they were all black. It looked like she was looking right into me, and I got cold chills all over my body. She smiled creepily at me. Not menacing, just creepily. I ran out that room and slammed the door shut behind me. I turned off all the lights, ran to the second floor and waited for my family to return from the hospital. When they did, I didn't mention anything to them. My step-grandmother is a witch. Not a horrible person, a literal witch. I know she was into the occult, and I never liked being at that house. But that's where I had my weight set. After that, I decided not to go downstairs again. I don't believe in ghosts, ghouls, or phantoms or apparitions in the traditional sense. I know what these beings are. They're demons who take on many forms and I don't want to be a part of them. Thankfully, we were later able to move out to our own house. And since then, we've been just fine. I'm 14 years old, and from a hilly village in England. Recently, I had been doing a project on urban legends. It was a class assignment, and most people did Bloody Mary. I chose Slenderman. I've experienced many paranormal things throughout my life, and this is a whole new level for me. So the reason I've mentioned the high school project is because it's relevant. There were two students which did Black Eyed Children, this was cool when it came to presenting. I started to feel sick to my stomach, and I thought I'd caught a bug. I asked to go to the receptionist and ended up passing out on the way, and my mother took me to see a doctor. But the doctor just said it could be a viral infection. Anyway, go forward two weeks later. I was walking my dog, going through the woods, since there's a thin path that leads to a golf course surrounded by wooded hills. As I was walking through there with my dog, it suddenly started getting chilly and a bit windy, and a bit of gravel flew into my eye, when I realised there was someone on the path, in a white dress covered in mud. It was a girl, and I noticed as I walked further that she had really pale skin. I was about three metres away, when all of a sudden my dog cowered. I stopped and tried to calm him, but he wouldn't advance. The girl was facing the other way, and it wasn't until I actually went to tap her on the shoulder to see if she was all right, that I realised she looked to be about 12. I hesitated as I went to tap her, and she turned her entire body round in one swift movement. She turned her head first, and did the same with the rest of her body ending with her feet. Are you okay? That's when I noticed. Her eyes were black, and looked more like marbles. Before I could finish talking, she asked, Can I touch your dog? It actually would have made me giggle if I wasn't so shaky. She was so direct with everything she said. No, I replied. She went on to asking further questions. Can I touch your hair? With each of these, she eventually asked if she could hold my hand. It took me by surprise, and everything was no. She then began crying, talking about how she needed to hold my hand. 
I eventually started running away, and she tried crawling over to me and touching my dog. My dog at this point was wincing from fear. I looked behind me and saw the girl on the ground pulling at her hair, and then she was gone. I looked back a second time, and it was like she had literally sunk to the ground. I ran home, and I don't know what I experienced, but I no longer take my dog anywhere near that path. My friend and I were always big into the paranormal and exploring haunted places. One night, we decided to go out into the woods in the current state I live in, and go to an abandoned camp that was used during World War II to keep Japanese prisoners. I forgot the proper name of what they were called, but I remember that was what he told me it was. It was miles away from where I live, deep among these winding dirt roads, something both he and I were very concerned about. My sister was with us at the time, but I don't think they saw what I did. It was getting dark, about 7pm at the time, and we thought it would be perfect to go searching for cryptids, as it fascinated us. We're just kids, you know. I thought we wouldn't find anything, as I wasn't a strong believer in the paranormal. So we were driving down the dirt road, and I feel my whole body involuntarily go rigid like it stiffened all the way up to my joints. I'm in my early 20s, so this was a very strange experience for me, but I dismissed it. As soon as we passed the water, so did the feeling. I went to bore my hands into fists, and my hands cracked, almost as if I had been sitting still for decades. This is where I wish I made him turn around. I got this feeling like I was being watched, and turned my head to look out the window. And I look into the forest while he and my sister got out the jeep, searching for what it was, but I couldn't see it. Shrugging it off and dismissing it, I stepped out the car, thinking it to be my overactive imagination or my ADHD playing up. God, I honestly wish it had been. We decided to search for the remains of that camp, the one I mentioned earlier, and that is when he and I heard it. He heard multiple voices, or so he claimed. I did too, and the only house around was the one across the lake. It was winter time, which means it was dead silent. The only noise was the soft breathing coming from my sister, my friend and myself. The silence was so eerie, like there was something smothering any sound with a blanket of nothing. Thinking about it now, honestly gives me the creeps. I kept beating myself up over it, because I should have known. My ex lurched up, and said we needed to go. He just said we had to leave. I brandished his pocket knife, and told my twin to get in front of me and move. That was when I made the mistake of looking behind me, and seeing two boys standing at the edge of the water with their backs to me. I squinted to look at them, and I'll never forget what I saw next. One of them turned to look at me with those eyes. It didn't look like there was anything there. And if it wasn't for that sense of fear I felt when looking into that void, I could have sworn it was just because it was dark. I snapped back to what I was doing and stood defensively, as I made my way back up the hill, the staring sensation intensifying. I felt worse, and I felt like I was being followed. I looked at my sister and told her to get into the car. She took her time and I told her to hurry the hell up while my ex to climb in, and we took off. That sensation followed me through the woods, until we got to the main road. What the hell were those two kids? In early October 2015, I saw what I speculate to be an adult black-eyed kid. I was making up some Halloween masks, 
in order to put into an antique mall where I have a booth. I looked up from the sofa and saw through a window to my left, someone staring directly at my house. They were standing on a knoll directly across the street on a neighbor's lawn. I did not recognize this person and thought it might be some drug addict or homeless person. I lived in a rural area, but houses are side by side on one acre lots. She was dressed all in black, dark hoodie, loose ill fitting pants above ankle length, odd flip flop sandals like slippers that had one big strap across the foot and no socks. Being in October in Connecticut, it was cold. She had one hand holding a cell phone to her ear and the other arm was held straight down like a soldier. Very thin, white hair, white skin. I watched through the top glass of my front door. This person walked across the lawn of the neighbor's house and into their driveway, then turned towards my house again. I saw the black eyes. Terrified, I ran into the kitchen from the living room and locked the door. I saw it cross the street and go into my driveway, and I watched it walk to the end of my short driveway and vanish before my eyes. It appeared and disappeared from view, like from another dimension. Me and my sister went on a road trip a few months ago, and we had recently heard about black eyed children, and we read stories about them for hours. The next day, I was with a few of my friends. We drove down an alley to get to a parking garage. Standing in the center of the alley was an old lady with white hair, wearing an old fashioned white dress. Even from a distance, I could see she was staring at me. As we got closer, I noticed her eyes were completely black. I started shaking and didn't really believe what I was seeing. I really thought that I was fabricating it in my mind because of having read about it just the night before. So I asked my friend in a shaky voice. Does that lady have black eyes? Holy crap, dude. His voice instantly became shaky and we turned around and went in another entrance to the parking garage. When we walked by the alley again a minute later, she was standing in the same spot. Every moment she was in sight, she was staring into my eyes. It was incredibly upsetting. I'm glad I didn't have to talk to her. She appeared to be 70 years or older. Could it have been a black eyed senior citizen? Really chilling experience. Last night, I was watching that 70s show reruns, eyes heavy and mind in a daze. I was starting to fall asleep when I awoke to what I thought was a loud thump by the patio door. The chocolate chip cookie I was halfway through slid off my hand, somersaulting down my torso, as this noise brought me to an awakening twitch. Just an animal, I thought, or the house settling. Eric Foreman is so goofy. Donna is always out of his league. Eric is lucky. I like this show. Back to sleep. Thump this time from the ceiling. I shrieked. What the hell is that? This time I sit up with upright posture like I'm ready to focus on any miniature detail that strikes my senses. I turn the kitchen light on just out of a general state of fear without really any concern about anything being in the kitchen. I check the back deck for the thump from before. That's super weird, I think. Nothing else happens, I start to relax. I'm not really worried at this point, but still a little on edge. I'm a college student spending the summer at home with my parents, working in downtown DC. They're at the beach. I'm alone in this rather large house. It's 10.36 PM. The door knocks. Seriously, I think. Now again, if I were on the set of a horror movie, or had been watching something scary for that matter, I would have drawn an immediate connection between the thumping noise and the door knocking unusually late at night, 
but neither of these things applied to me at that moment. So I didn't. I was still kind of anxious though from those thumps. But when the door knocked, my attention immediately forgot about this noise and was likely nothing to worry about. Probably a salesperson or a mailman. I remember one time a few years back, a UPS man rang our doorbell at about midnight to drop something off. I was the only one awake, so this scared the crap out of me. Maybe it was something like that. The most likely scenario would be my buddy Frank, who considered coming over but said he was too tired. He can be a little spacey though sometimes, so I guess he could have changed his mind without telling me. I'll guess I'll go over there and at least tell whoever the hell it is that I'd like my privacy. Unless it's Frank, of course, who I will then remind how spacey he can be. A little weirded out by the situation, though, I grabbed the first thing that resembles a weapon. An old lacrosse stick. I hold it from the head with the shaft facing outwards like a lightsaber. As I turn the corner to the foyer, I see through the door a pair of skinny legs with odd worn slippers. All right, this is a little weird. That's definitely a skinny chick. Maybe she's confused trying to visit a friend and knocked on the wrong house. The house next door is about the same size. Doesn't really look a lot like mine, but I don't know what else it could possibly be. All of this enters my mind in the matter of seconds between my footsteps in the kitchen and the doormat between the front door and the rest of my home. As I stand between the large modern door and whoever the hell is out there, I lean my lacrosse stick on the ground behind me, so this stranger won't see it. As my hand floats hesitantly towards the doorknob, I hear a voice coming from the other side of the door. No clear words, just light whispers. I assume someone must be with the slippers girl because I haven't even opened the door yet, and as far as I can tell, this person hasn't even seen that someone is home, unless she's talking to herself. That thought didn't calm my mind at all, though. My hands stopped frozen in midair, about halfway between the rest of my body and the door, like I was about to do some weird robot dance move. I wait for several seconds, disturbed by the odd synchronization between my movement towards the doorknob and the voice outside. I wait longer. No voices. I take a deep breath. It's through my nose and out through my mouth. Knock, knock. I open the door about three quarters way, quickly, like a toddler anxious and curious to discover the monster in their closet. I stick the right half of my body out, facing two dark feminine figures on my porch. The first thing I notice is those beat up slippers. I look up from there, my head and neck tilting upwards to see the rest of her. Straight black hair, uncombed, matted in different directions. She looked sickly, shaking in the cold, with a hooded sweatshirt and tiny khaki shorts. She's about five foot three, looks to be about 13, staring straight forward, which for me, at five foot nine, standing on a raised surface above my lowered porch, is at my pelvis. In the dark, I cannot make out the features of her face, but could tell that something about her was awkward, the way she stood there off balance. Her neck tilted to the left side like a chewed up overused doll. Before I can react in any way, I observe her partner, about a half a foot behind her, and to the left, a noticeably younger girl, maybe nine years old, but with about an inch over her sister, wearing a ragged, dark blue shirt, black pants, rain boots. She had similar black hair, though didn't have the same bizarre demeanour as her older sister. I look down at these two girls and have no idea how long it had been since I had opened the door. Have they said anything? What do I say? This is too weird. Uh, can I help you? I muster out, 
in the tone I typically use to talk to kids, but with an undertone of chill to my voice. I stutter some when I'm nervous or excited, and here I could barely make out a word. Hello, sir. Please, we are cold and would like to use the phone. The younger one says that, her head facing straight forwards. Her tone, it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. It was feminine, sure, but each word left her mouth fully independent of the other one, like they were just words being spit out of a machine and placed in the correct order by a third party. Almost like a robot. But she was clearly human. A young girl I'm speaking to. Yet somehow very, very off. She didn't sound her age. She sounded at least 14 or 15. But she looked no older than 10. Why did she speak to me and not the older sister? What's going on? Is her older sister shy? Mentally handicapped? Am I dreaming? And what does this mean about using my phone? It was like she was speaking of a script and mixed up her question. Did she mean to ask something else? Not sure how to respond to this arbitrary question I manage. Ah, uh, well, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you two lost? First, nothing. Just stares, straight forward, directly ahead. As if with no visual awareness. Then, the younger one. Please, sir. We are alone. I need to call home. Let us in. Her response, with the same monotone voice, didn't really answer my question. It was like she was speaking without any concern over it. Just when it was time for her next line, and the last part, let us in, like a command completely separate from her prior polite, candid request. Trembling in fear, confused, with a strong sensation telling me something was horribly wrong, I said, Well, uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot let you in my house. You'll have to stay here while I grab a phone and call for you. I couldn't leave these two kids stranded out here. But I knew. Something in the pit of my stomach just told me. I could not let them in. I was scared out of my mind. The two just looked straight forward, not responding. And suddenly, the older one, who has yet to move or say anything, changes her expression completely. She squeezes her fists as they shake at her sides as if in great pain, and without moving her pale face or neck, makes a smile, showing her teeth all at once. They were sharp, inhuman, like an animal's. At this, I make an obvious, loud scream of terror. The younger one notices my fear, and looks up at me, and her pale face, her eyes, blackness. Pure black. No clear iris or retina. Like two black marbles. I then noticed her silent, smiling older sister's black eyes as well. A grotesque nausea floods my stomach, closing in on me, choking me. I am frozen. I do not manage a scream. I can't. I am lost in fear. My entire body speeds up, tingling, numbing. I lose myself. And finally, after what feels like several minutes, I let out a noise of horror that I don't think I've ever made. As I close the door in front of me, and retreat to the safety of my home. My body is still shaking. I stand, crying, trembling in the front of the door. I need to reach my cell phone, which is in the family room. I can still hear that 70s show in the background, which brings some relief. But it sounds off now, foreign, almost like another language in my fearful state. I need to call the cops. I can't let them in. Get out of here! I yell while banging on the door in an attempt to scare them off. Undiscernible sounds come from the other side, 
like animal cries or barks. It doesn't sound like the younger girl. I know it isn't. It's the older girl. The silent, mentally off one. But I can't fathom this. No. I need to reach my cell phone, but I can't move. I can't lose track of them. I can see the slippers in the side window. I know she's still there. More animal noises from outside. I scream, yell, bang my lacrosse stick against the door. Anything I can get out of my tired lungs and muscles. I felt like I was being attacked by a grizzly bear. I was in full-on survival mode, doing all I could to scare them away. But any noise I made was matched by the older girl, with her disturbing barks and screams that to this day haunt my dreams. Then, from the other side of the door, I hear a muffled, We just want to call our mother, from the younger girl. Please, we are scared and alone. Let us in. Let us in. That last part, let us in. In the exact same cadence, twice over. Like a recording. Please, let us in. Like a chant. Let us in. Let us in. Let us in. The younger girl continues, each command louder and more assertive than the last one as the older girl's noises matches her demands. I wait for any sign of safety of this horrible nightmare coming to an end. I continue screaming at them until finally it stops. The noises, the chanting, gone. The slippers are gone. I look out my window, sprinting legs, the older girl running the speed of a male track star, but her legs twisting over each other like a circus freak. This is so screwed up. I see her trail off, catching up with the younger sister, who must have given the orders to leave while she strayed for a minute or two barking and screeching and yelping like a Neanderthal. I watch as the older sister finds her younger sister waiting on the other side of the road. They stand there, not looking back at my house, staring straight ahead the other way like they are waiting for something, someone. And suddenly, a large, wiry figure walks towards them, long legs and arms and lanky, inhuman features, with the shape of a woman, but far too tall and awkward in form, like one of those scarecrow-like animations from a Tim Burton film. This creature, this monster, leads them away into the night. I did not leave my front door the entire night. I didn't sleep, and barely have since. Close family, my girlfriend, and my friends want to believe me. They say they don't think I'm crazy, but I feel like they don't really believe me. This is actually so screwed up, whatever it is, whoever they are, it's real. They're like these subhumans trying to take us, or have them join them. I don't know what it is. They create this energy of fear and terror, like nothing I have ever experienced. I lay awake at night, terrified of when I open my eyes, that that older sister will be outside my window, hanging from a tree smiling at me, barking, waiting for me to walk outside, leave the house. I haven't left since. Update. It's been a few days now and I've managed to leave the house at the request of my loved ones. Each hour that passes I do feel a little more safe. I know this sounds like something out of a horror movie, but it's so messed up and the realest thing I've ever experienced. This happened about 15 years ago, when my girls were still small. Their mother had passed away very recently, and the grief and pain were still very much inflicting every corner of our lives. It is so very difficult to move on when you lose someone that close. But I was still a father, and tried my best every day to do what I could to keep my two girls happy, and life ticking along as normal. 
The girls went to an after-school club. Being the only parent, I needed them to stay late so that I could pick them up from work and establish some kind of balance without my wife being there anymore. This happened during the winter. It was a regular Thursday and I was just pulling up to the school. I got out of my car and picked up my two girls. During the drive home, we were making small talk and asking them how their day was. To any parent who has kids, you know that most of the time they'll reply with either something along the lines of, school was boring, and when you ask the other question, what did you learn? They'll most likely say nothing, as was the same with my girls. However, today, one of them said something that really got to me. My youngest, Jane. Jane, who is about six at this point, says that she was playing in the playground with her friends when there were two kids who were outside of school, i.e. on the other side of the fence, who were supposed to be in school. I asked her what she meant, and she said that there were these two kids who were about ten and seven, who were just staring at all the other kids, wearing these thick grey hoodies just watching all the children. She said that this kind of freaked her out a little bit, and she was more pissed than anything, because she thought that they should be in school. Because of course, as a six-year-old, other children in school means only two things. One, that they're being bad, or two, that if they're not in school, why should she be in school? Oh, clever Jane. Anyway, I kind of brushed this off and pushed it to the back of my mind, not really thinking about it and trying to focus more on what I was going to cook the girls for dinner and wondering if there were still any leftovers from the night before. We get into the driveway, I close the front fence and in we go. The girls do their homework as I start preparing dinner. After a pretty regular evening of eating homework checking, and TV time, we're all sat on the couch, pretty much exhausted. By this point, it's about 9pm, and I am shameful to admit that I was starting to doze off in front of the TV. It was some kid show the girls wanted to watch, and it had successfully put me into a very deep sleep. The girls were running around, and I hear knocking but I assume that it's just them playing. So I kind of close my eyes and get comfortable on the sofa again. After a few minutes, it definitely sounds like they're talking to someone. I press a button on the remote and it tells me that it's already 10, 15 PM. Shit, these girls shouldn't be in bed. I turn off the TV, rub my eyes and slowly start to get up. That's when my ears tune into something. At the door, the girls are talking to someone. Apparently, someone wants to come in. I rush over to the front door because I've already told my girls never to open it for anyone and to always ask me. Why the hell have they done it this time? They should know better. I rush over and look down. Thank goodness it's still closed. But through the window, it's very clear to see that my two girls are talking to these two hooded figures. They're not particularly tall, and I instantly assumed that they were children. I got a very nervous feeling just standing there, and I asked my girls what was going on. Jane was quick to pipe up. These are the girls from the school. I told you, Dad. I'm asking them why they weren't in school, but they just want to come in. This is a bit weird, I think. And then Emma chimes in. Dad, I'm scared. Don't let them in. I tell my girls to rush upstairs and go put their pyjamas on and get ready for bed, and that I will deal with this. Obediently, they both run off. I look down and ask them what they want, hesitant about opening the door. Why are two kids awake at this hour, without their parents and wandering the streets? Part of me wanted to open the door, invite them in, get them warm and call their parents. But 
there was something just so strange about this whole situation. I can't even describe what it was, but there was a palpable feeling of dread within me. Something which should not be akin to two small children. Suddenly, the taller of the two speaks up. Excuse me, sir. We need to come in. We've lost our mummy. And we're so cold. Okay, I reply. Well, do you know her phone number? Perhaps I should get in touch and she can come and collect you quickly. There's a pause and a brief silence. It's almost as if they didn't hear me. Please, sir, we need to come in and call our mummy. Uh, okay. Do you know her number? I'm sure we can figure this out. Still no reply. Still eerie silence after I ask for her number. This is beginning to feel extremely dodgy. I'd read a story in the newspaper that people put these child baskets in the middle of the road and leave them as bait for people to come out of their car and then be attacked or abducted, or at least get their car stolen. I wondered if this was a similar situation where children were knocking on doors in the middle of the night for unsuspecting parents to open their doors and then be the target of some attack. This was definitely giving me creepy vibes and I was now more adamant to not open the door. I told the two hooded children as a last resort that if they wanted to, they can go around and open the back door and sit on the back porch to be safe. But I didn't want to let them in and they could only do that on the condition that they gave me their mother's number, or I'd have to call the police and have them taken to the station so that they can find out where they belong. When I said that, there was silence again. Please, Brian, we need to come in and use your phone. We're cold. The window on my door is completely transparent. Not one of those funky windows that you can't see out of properly. And when the tallest of the two looks me in the eyes, her eyes are pitch black. Keep in mind that we have a porch light and it's very clear to see that there are no whites to her eyes, no colors, no nothing. Just two pools of infinite darkness staring up at me. I start panicking. This is otherworldly. This isn't right. I start to stutter and tell the two hooded children that I'm sorry I couldn't help them and to try another door. I quickly close the blind to our door window and walk away. I go upstairs and check on my girls. Both of them are in bed, trying to fall asleep, but they can't. Just like me, the tapping on the door and the calling of my name is getting quite chilling. The way my bedroom is positioned, I can look down my window and see directly onto the porch. And there they are, both looking straight up at me. I think this is insane. And I call the police, telling them that there are two children who have been dropped off or left or abandoned or something, and that someone needs to come and collect them. The person on the phone asks if this is a prank. And when I tell them that it's not, she says that someone should be there soon. It took all of 20 minutes for the sirens to start rolling down the road. I kept looking at the two hooded figures, on and off during that time. The moment I heard the sirens, did they start walking away. The police reached my house, and I saw them walking into the distance. I ran down the stairs and pointed in the direction that they just left in. The police quickly gave chase, but never found the two hooded figures. They asked if I was joking or not, as they weren't really sure if this was a real call. And that's when my youngest comes down the stairs and says, No officer, daddy's telling the truth. I saw them outside the gates of school, and then they came to my house. This little detail really got the officer as he said that it sounded extremely dodgy. He patrolled the area 
and assured us that they'd keep a lookout to make sure that they didn't come back, and that if they did, to call straight away and to never answer the door. To this day, I'm unsure whether this is some kind of paranormal or unexplainable event, or perhaps a sinister plot on their parents' part to maybe rob the house, or worse, take me or my girls. I honestly don't know what to believe. It was only years later that I heard of other people who had encountered children with pitch black eyes, and it made me wonder if they are perhaps something a bit more supernatural than I originally anticipated. Nonetheless, I never do want to meet them again. I've heard stories of black-eyed kids over recent years. Some of them are just downright creepy. I'm a sensitive. I do my best to be aware and focused. So when slash if I'm in danger, or loved ones are in danger. My intuition goes on red alert. With that being said, I'd like to share something interesting. During the most recent New Year's Eve, my son, myself, and my fiance had a quiet night at home. We watched movies, made dinner, and my son went to bed fairly early, since he was only five no wild party. We were marathoning watching Netflix while laughing and chatting in the master bedroom, well after midnight, at which point there was a confident, yet creepy, solid knock at our front door. We live in the country. It's a bit more remote, and all of our neighbours were friendly enough, but they wouldn't have knocked that late, as it would be perceived as rude. Our jeep was parked in the garage, so it wouldn't be related to a car having the lights on or anything. I'm listening to this, because that happened once. The keys to the jeep in the house were securely hung in place. The fun time we were having quickly shifted to an odd feeling of confusion, coupled with unusual terror. It was really odd. We aren't fearful people. We simultaneously checked our smartphones for anyone stopping by and announced nothing, except a few well wishes from friends due to it being New Year's Eve and all. I got up to stretch, and my fiancé made sure I wasn't about to answer the door. Hell no, I said. We laughed uncomfortably. I joked with him saying, because you're going to do it. I teased him. He scowled and smiled, knowing full well he would have to normally. Why were we so on edge? We both remarked how odd we felt about the knocking and the late hour. In fact, we didn't budge from the master bedroom. Neither of us felt good about checking the door, and figured whomever it was had the wrong house. Then another knock. We were getting agitated and that strange feeling of terror was back, strong as ever. I've never felt that way about someone knocking on the door before, nor have I not felt safe to answer. It was really odd. I'll paint a more clear picture. Good neighbourhood. Our front porch light bulb needed to be replaced, so it was dark as hell out there. I thought it was really weird that someone would be standing out there in the complete pitch black darkness for three minutes knocking like that. I mentioned this to my fiance. The peephole would give us away if we stole a look, since lights were on throughout the house. We didn't dare check. Why? That senseless feeling of fear was disabling. It made it so two grown very capable at defending themselves adults were essentially cowering in fear after two knocks at the front door late at night. What gives? It took about a half hour, but I eventually felt a lot better, no longer afraid, and felt that whoever it was had left. I checked the front of the house through the kitchen window. No cars, no neighbours, no parties just the calm sound of crickets. 
I proceeded to open the front door, after listening to make absolutely certain that no one would surprise me. Like a drunk ex-boyfriend passed out on the porch, or something equally hilarious. Satisfied, I opened the front door. It was quiet. In fact, it was too quiet. No sound at all. That's odd. I had a feeling instantly of being watched. From where? Who? What? I got the chills and shut the door, then armed the alarm system. I thought to myself that if they came back, we can call to report suspicious activity to the police. However, it then occurred to me that we wouldn't get through. It was New Year's Eve after all. Awesome, right? Even to me, it sounds like I'm overly paranoid and getting spooked for no reason. I would think the same had it not happened to me. When the second knock took place for a split second, I thought, oh crap, what if, regarding the Black Eyed Kids stories I'd read. Mainly it was the remarkable senseless fear we felt that tipped me off. My son slept through it. No, I didn't share this epiphany with my fiancé at that moment. We were too terrified to make any noise. He's legitimately a skeptic. He doesn't know anything about the BEK, and I wasn't about to go into it at the time. He shared there was no way in hell he was answering the door, and I thought his reaction was odd. Especially since he didn't know any of the stories. During this ordeal, the doorbell wasn't used at all. What's strange is that the only light in the porch area would have been the illuminated button of the front doorbell. Why wasn't the doorbell pushed? There's no porch light out there. It had burnt out. It was at a height which needed a ladder to be reached. During the busy holidays, we hadn't gotten around to replace the bulb yet. It was on our to-do list of things. It was moved to the top of the list after this experience. It was super late at night, and I've lived here for eight years. As an example, the only time our door was ever knocked on super late at night was a friendly neighbour letting us know, and this was months ago, that I had left my truck door open when we had unloaded groceries. He announced himself as he was knocking, saying who he was and why before we even reached the door. We were grateful for his concern, and that this was the only time it happened. It's a good neighbourhood after all. What's interesting is that with my previous knowledge of the Black Eyed Kids, that occurred to me during this experience, so I stayed put. There was no way I was going to check out who was there, just to be certain. It's more important to express that the immense fear I felt was paralyzing. I truly feel for anyone who has the displeasure of experiencing a black-eyed kid. If that isn't what was on the porch, then it was something equally as terrible. It's also important to share this tidbit. I'm not a person who's normally fearful of much. Honestly, there is danger in just about everything. However, that doesn't stop me from my daily adventures and I'd rather enjoy life than live in fear. I'm a streetwise female who is always aware of her surroundings, as well as a survivor of a home invasion as well. Interestingly enough, when someone tried to rob me years prior, they were discovered in my kitchen when I was getting a quick glass of water before bed. We hadn't even been home for two minutes. I kept a burrito in the fridge to keep cold filtered water. When I opened the fridge, the light illuminated the kitchen well enough so that I could see the man standing on the kitchen corner. As unnerving as that was, I wasn't afraid. Fight kicked in versus flight. All I did was look straight at the man and say, get out. I walked towards him with purpose and he fled. I wasn't harmed. He ran from the house. My then boyfriend, back then it was someone I dated a few years ago, was amazed at my bravery. I've been trained in self-defense, have taken martial arts for years. So there you have it. 
Sometimes people fall on hard times and take desperate measures to rob others. And that basically was someone looking to rob a house that they thought was empty. I surprised them and they fled. With this experience that I've described, my instincts were going nuts. It was so terrifying that I wanted to share this with the community as a helpful way to warn others. If you have someone or something knocking late at night and it's followed by a similar feeling of overwhelming dread, simply trust yourself. Do not go near the door, nor could I, no matter what. That dreadful feeling was so pronounced, our instincts are there to keep us safe. So trust that feeling. It's there to keep you safe. Don't second guess yourself. We have since installed a security camera and restored the porch light. It was the summer of 1986, and I had just graduated from high school. I was living in Vancouver, British Columbia, and my girlfriend and I spent the afternoon at Kitsilano Beach, suntanning. She had to leave early for work, so I stayed on the beach, alone. It was around four, and I was hungry. I walked up to the beach over an area called Spanish Banks. There was a concession out there, and I had a long line. It was an Expo 86, so we had a ton of tourists that summer, and the beach was packed. I placed my order, but was told that it would be a 15 to 20 minute wait for my food. I perched myself on a bench and proceeded to wait. For some reason, I looked across the street. The concession stand is adjacent to the road, a narrow two-lane road, not the best for beach traffic. And the other side of the road is a forest called the UBC Endowment Lands, attached to the university. There was a guy walking down through the forest, which was also a steep hill. There is no sidewalk below, and it was a really dangerous place to try and cross the street. Not only that, it was an odd place to come out of. Imagine a steep hill with lots of bushes and trees going straight down a curb, and then a busy street. The second that I saw this guy, and I was far away at the concession stand, I had that gut-wrenching fear that everyone describes. Even though he was far away, I could tell that he was grinning maliciously, fixated on me. He crossed the street grinning, and at that moment there were no cars, so he got across easily. He made a beeline straight to where I was, and went and sat on a bench and crossed from me. I'm not good with distances, but I approximate it must have been 10 to 15 feet. He was First Nations. A bit older than I was, maybe 1920. He had medium length hair and was wearing a white t-shirt and a red flannel shirt over it, unbuttoned. He was wearing jeans. I can't remember his shoes, runners of some kind. He was fairly attractive, but utterly evil. Malicious was the word that kept going through my mind. Now his eyes, they were black. No whites could be seen but they were not shiny like all of the other accounts I've read. His were dull. The way that I described it to my boyfriend later was that they looked like scratched black plastic. They also gave me the feeling of when you look into a microscope of binoculars and you can see your own eyelashes squished against the lens. And it's almost spider-like. His eyes and his everything frightened me like nothing ever else had. He sat there grinning at me. He knew that I was terrified, and I knew that I had to pretend that I was not. I felt totally alone, even though there were tons of people around. No one else seemed to notice anything amiss. I felt as though knowing that this person existed made me hate being alive. The world would never be safe if things like him existed. I sat there acting totally normal on the outside, trying to keep it together, because it seemed instrumental to my survival. I had no idea what this thing would do, 
but I felt as if my life was in danger. My food was ready for pickup. I got it, and then proceeded to go over to the payphone, and I kept my back to him as I phoned my boyfriend. I told him to get over to Spanish banks because there was a really scary guy here and I didn't know how to get away. After my boyfriend hung up, I stayed in the phone booth, pretending to talk to someone. At some point, I had to get off. Maybe someone wanted the phone, and I sat back on the bench, and he stayed, grinning. A minute or two before my boyfriend got there, he got up and sauntered away down the beach. When he arrived, he wanted to go after him. I grabbed his arm and told him that we had to get out of there now. I couldn't properly explain it to my boyfriend, just how terrifying that experience was. I still can never explain it properly. It was scarier than any murderer. It felt as though as if this thing could do something to you. It wouldn't just end your life. It would do something that would destroy or torment your soul forever. I've had a couple of other experiences that are slightly related to this, though different. Today was a day like any other day. I woke up at noon, got showered and dressed, cleaned out my room. My mom was out shopping, and my dad was up on some land we owned trying to clear out the brush. My younger sister was at school. Today, she had a choir concert. So I was searching for something nice to wear. The day felt unusually long. It's almost like I was anticipating something. I felt nervous, but peaceful. My mum came home, so we went for a walk with our dog, and talked as usual. She told me shopping was lonely without me. I had a bad day yesterday, so she wanted to let me sleep. I put my arm around my mum and hugged her with a smile. We talked about my fears of college, which I'll be starting in August. We talked about things we're looking forward to during the holidays. We talked about things that make us sad, things that cheer us up, songs we like, old musicians, and how much Steven Tyler looks like Mick Jagger, and had a laugh about that. I couldn't seem to shake my feelings of anxiety. A few hours had passed, and my sister had come home. We were in her bedroom so that I could help her figure out what to wear. I finally found a pretty white top and a pair of silky dress pants. She got dressed and left for her concert. I felt stressed, so I decided to stay back to get a shower before I left. I was standing in the shower, warm water hitting my back and the steam relaxing my entire body. I was stepping out, when I was suddenly filmed with an overwhelming sense of dread and worry. I felt dizzy and disoriented. I tried to shake the feeling, so I blow dried my hair and put on my dress. I heard knocking at the front door, but I felt sheer terror. I didn't want to go downstairs, and I didn't want to answer the door. My dog started growling and barking and scratching the door. Hello? I need to use your phone. At this point, I was obligated. I ran down and opened the door. I left the storm door shut and locked it, so I was able to talk through the next scene. It was a girl of about 13 with long blonde hair, wearing a bright blue hoodie and torn jeans. Next to her was another little girl of about six or seven. She had short blonde hair, and little above the shoulder length, and was wearing a pink dress with flowers on it. Both were looking down, so I couldn't see their faces. Uh, hi. Can I help you girls? We need to use your phone. We're not from around here, and we lost our mother. She's worried. The older girl mumbled, still looking down. I felt compelled to let them in, but I wasn't willing to risk anything with that horrible feeling I had. I'd heard so many stories about the black-eyed kids, and researched into it a lot. 
These stories had made me terribly curious and intrigued me greatly. I know too much about them to deny what's happening. You can use my cell phone, but you can't come in. We've been outside all day, ma'am. Please, we're cold. It was a warmer day. It was in the high 50s, Fahrenheit, compared to what it had been. I can't let you in. If you need to call your mom, I can let you use my cell. That's it. So I stepped out onto the porch, not knowing what to expect. I noticed the older girl get more tense, like she was starting to get angry. Please, mom. We are very tired and have to call our mom. Her tone had gotten more aggressive. It was unsettling. Look at me. What? No. We need to use your phone. I said, look at me. If I can't see you in the eyes, I won't let you in. They both looked up at me. They had large, dead black eyes. I felt as if my soul was being drawn into them. My heart sank. These were the things I'd read about. The soulless, violent children were standing in front of me. I felt so compelled to say yes. I almost felt guilty for being so aggressive in my response, but I knew what they were. I can't let my compassion overtake my common sense. What are you? I know those eyes. What are you children? What do you want? She said nothing. She tilted her head and stared directly at me in the eyes. It felt almost hypnotic. It's a feeling I can't really explain. They looked at each other and smiled. Ma'am, we're two girls who need to call their worried mother. Please, this is the last time I'll ask nicely. She kept that twisted smile on her face and just glared at me. I backed into the door, opened it, and slammed it in their face. I locked the door and walked through the house in a panic, making sure all the windows and doors were locked. I heard knocking on the window. I backed myself against a wall and peered over just enough where they couldn't see me. But I could see them. I crawled onto the floor to another room. They then came to that side of my house and began knocking on the windows of the room I was in. It's like they could see me, no matter how much I tried to hide. In a panic, I called the police. This is Carlisle's daughter. I need someone. There are some girls knocking on my windows and they won't go. I told them I can't let them in. Please come. I'm scared. My dad is good friends with a lot of the cops so they know who I am by my father's name. My dog was still barking furiously. I'd honestly forgotten he was even there. His barking shook me back to reality. The cops soon arrived and told the girls to leave. They actually walked away. I wasn't sure what to make of that. I've never heard of them just walking away. Maybe they have their own fears, cops being one of them. The cops looked shocked when they first started talking to the girls, but eventually got them to leave. I realised I was really late to my sister's concert, and in a panic, grabbed my shoes and everything and drove over to the school. On a positive note, the concert was great. The Coralie sounded beautiful, and I was terrified to go home after. With reason, of course. I truly cannot make heads or tails of my experience. Let me tell you, though, if you ever run into these children, you'll regret answering the door. Whatever you do, don't look into their eyes. It's like they have some sort of hypnotizing power. You'll feel dizzy and sick. You'll never forget your running with these inhuman children. So a few years ago, I had a run-in with the entities known as the Black-Eyed Children. For those of you who don't know, the Black-Eyed Children are beings that roam the night. They knock on doors and try and get into your house. When you get a good look at them, they look like they're from a different time period. Then you see their face. They have no eyes. Or rather, their eyes are so black, they look like they're not even there. Any encounter with them 
results in the most terrifying night of most people's lives. However, my encounter with them just falls short. For reference, I was 17 when this occurred. At the time of writing this, I am a 19, almost 20 year old, and I was working at an indoor water park that might have been referred to as the puddle. I was a lifeguard and was the last one heading home late one night. I was soaking wet and freezing, despite it being around 80 degrees outside. I got into my car and locked it, pulling my phone out for some music. I read a couple of messages and got distracted, and suddenly there was a tap at my window. I looked up and saw a couple of kids staring at me. I rolled the window down just enough to hear them clearly. What's up, guys? Are you lost? I asked in a polite tone. They didn't really respond. They didn't really move at all. Finally, the smaller child spoke, and as he did, my heart dropped. The voice that came out of this child's mouth was deeper than my own. It was so deep that it sounded like Satan himself spoke to me. We just need a ride home. Could you let us in and take us there? I couldn't move. I was frozen in fear. Come on, mister. Just open the door. It demanded, knocking again. As they were knocking, a car's headlights illuminated their faces. They had voids where their eyes should be. When they saw my look of horror, they grinned and started pounding so hard on my window that I thought it would break. I kept trying to start my car, but it wouldn't. Finally, one of the housekeepers of the hotel the puddle was built around came out to throw trash, and I heard them walking and went to warn them about the kids. When I look up, they were gone. Now this could have been a hallucination brought on by the amount of stress I went through, but it was very real for me. Anyway, my car ended up starting and I made it home in record time. Like I said, it's not the scariest thing that's happened to me, but it's up there. Let's just hope they don't find me again. I used to do ghost investigations with a foundation for paranormal research. So I was used to going into dark places and trying to come up with rational explanations. The stories about black eyed kids had intrigued me and I always felt a bit uneasy when thinking that they were real. What that could mean. So a coworker and I were having a discussion about paranormal topics and I thought about the BEKs. This guy was a bit gullible and was a little spooked by some of the stories of my investigating adventures. I told him that I wanted to talk with him about the subject, but if I didn't, he might be a target for those dark forces and he'd have to agree before I tell him to alleviate any guilt of my part if something strange were to happen. He agreed. I told him about the BEKs and some stories I'd read over the previous years and then embellishing it and saying, now that I've told you them, you'll get some kind of visit within three days. He laughed it off and kind of didn't believe me, although I saw a nervousness on his face. Two days passed and then on the third, I told him, today's the day, and he had actually forgotten all about it. And we laughed about it a bit, making woo, scary ghost noises. So I go home, do some chores around the house and then went upstairs to do some exercise. I was just on the treadmill at the time and I was binge watching Friends on Netflix. The episode was almost over and the TV sort of just faded out to black and I thought maybe the power was acting up or the TV just went kaput when I heard the most sinister child giggling that turned into a sort of demonic high laugh, kind of half and half. There on my TV screen, was a picture of a red-headed, freckled, 10 to 12 year old kid with solid black eyes. The picture was sort of zoomed in and turned on a slight angle, as if you had tilted your head to the side. 
It just stayed there, and I jumped off the treadmill and onto the sides of the equipment, and just stared at it with my mouth agape. The laugh giggled again, and then it faded out, and friends faded back in, and the end credits were about to roll, sort of picking up where it had left off. The whole thing happened in about 30 seconds. I couldn't sleep. I went over and over it in my mind, that somehow I got the visit from the black-eyed kids, but not in person as one would think. I could only hear that demonic giggle laughter in my head over and over, and literally scared myself. I told my co-worker about it, and he then thought I was making it up. I scoured the internet for a photo that looked just like what I saw, and while my photoshopping skills are limited, I managed to recreate it. We were both very spooked. As a kid, I always had these dreams of black-eyed children knocking on my front door asking to use my phone. They started off fairly polite, but as the dreams occurred more often, they got very demanding about it. There were things about my dreams that always stumped me. My dad's car would be parked somewhere differently than normal. It wouldn't be there at all, or be where it should not be. After a while, I started waking up and actually opening the door to let them in. And wherever my dad's car was in the dream, it actually was. I always fell asleep before he got home, so I'd have no way of knowing if he was actually home from work or not, let alone exactly where his car was parked. That's basically where it ended as a kid. I just had those really vivid dreams and always remember feeling uneasy in that house. Fast forward about 15 years later, and I'm having those same dreams again, except they won't come near the house and just stand in my yard at my bedroom window. They ask the normal questions, if they can come in, if they can use the phone, and it's always the same story where my mum needs to know where they are, and it's the same kids from my childhood dreams. It always ends up saying, soon, and then they're gone. So just tonight I start feeling really uneasy, as if someone's watching me as I'm walking to work, which is odd because I live in a nice area and never get that vibe. Well, as I get a bit further down the road, I go into a full-blown panic attack, for no reason, and I see this kid standing at the overpass, down the road from my house in the pitch black as I was using my phone for a flashlight. I get closer and he asks if he can use my phone. So I hop on my skateboard and just take off. I hear him say again loudly, we weren't lying, and then he vanishes out of nowhere. Immediately, my uneasy feeling goes away and my panic attack stops. Do these spirits or whatever the hell they are sometimes latch onto people? It's been a long time since I last experienced any of this. I thought it was over, but apparently not. I had a seriously strange encounter last night. I ordered a frozen yogurt from Postmates, which is a food delivery service, at around 10.45 p.m. At around 11.20, I received a notification that the delivery driver was close, so my girlfriend and I stood at the curb waiting for our food. I was immediately surprised to see that my delivery guy was driving a brand new Jaguar. I have never seen a Postmates delivery driver in such an expensive car, as I'm sure many of you probably haven't seen either. The driver also had a young, seemingly normal looking man as a passenger. When the driver got out, he moved bizarrely slow, and the entirety of his eyes were black. It were as if his pupils had expanded to cover the entirety of the visible area of his eyeball. The worst part, however, was that everything that this guy did was horrifyingly creepy. I have never met a creepier individual. When he exited the car, he said something along the lines of, I was in the neighborhood, and thought I'd stop by. This statement made no sense, because I had just ordered food from him. Also, the guy put my frozen yogurt in the trunk. 
Keep in mind the item is small enough to fit into a cup holder. So why would he put it in the trunk when it can easily fit right by him? Then he slowly fished around the trunk for my yogurt. My girlfriend said he stopped what he was doing, looked up and stared at her with what she described as an extremely creepy grin for a significant amount of time. I was looking somewhere else at this point because I just thought the guy was weird and wanted to keep my contact with him to a minimum. I chalked up the creepiness to the guy being socially off and the eyes to a medical condition. However, my girlfriend was absolutely petrified and told me about these black eyed people she'd heard about. I don't know what his deal was, but I'd rather never see him or anyone like that again. I have three stories from my own friends who've had interactions with these beings. Firstly, in Eugene, Oregon, my friend Amy told me about her interaction with a BEK. And this is amazing because the BEK had black skin. It's the only example I've ever seen of this case. So this being knocked on her door late one night and simply asked for water. Amy brought her some water in a glass. The being drank it, set the glass down and walked off into the night. All black eyes, of course. Secondly, my friend in Grant Pass, Oregon, David, had a classic experience in a car when two young boys with black eyes knocked on the windows and wanted in. He just got terrified and locked the doors and drove away. Now the third story involves my aunt Rosie in Medford, Oregon. One day she gets the knock at the door and it's two little girls dressed like little house on the prairie. And they've got the antique baby buggy with little dolls in it. My aunt Rosie asked the girls if they were okay, and they asked for water to drink. My aunt Rosie asked if they wanted to come inside. They said no. Could they just have some water to drink? She goes to the back and grabs two bottles of water from the fridge, returns, gives them the water bottles, and the girls proceed to guzzle the water down like hungry wolves. My aunt turns from the baby buggy to where she was doting on the dolls and sees them doing this and tells them they can just take the water with them. And that surprises the girls greatly. They said okay and wandered back down the long driveway. My aunt closes the door then thinks those girls could have been angels, reopens the door and they're gone, just gone. And this is too along a driveway for them to just disappear like that. Unlike other houses on the street. She asked around the neighborhood after that and nobody ever knew of the girls nor had seen them. I asked if she knew what black eyed kids were and she said no. I asked her if their eyes were normal and she said no, that they were all black. I live in rural Vermont and I am an amateur author. It's my hobby, you could say, but I've been interested in black eyed kids for quite some time and wanted to write a book about it. However, I've been doing research on them for about a week now. And two nights ago, my wife and I were awoken by a knock on the front door at about 2.40 AM. It was a pretty loud knock. Not smashing, just three loud thuds. I told my wife I'd go downstairs and check it out. However, when I got closer to the door, I had an odd sensation of fear come over me. It was very strange. I can't really explain the feeling. I hesitated for a moment, but then I buckled up and opened the door. And to my surprise, it was just a kid. At first, I thought it was the neighbor's kid who lived down the street as he's roughly the age of 13 to 14. He had his head down and was wearing a dark gray hoodie. And I asked him kind of angrily what he wanted. He then continued to stand there and said nothing. I raised my voice and asked him what his name was. That's when he looked up at me. 
I don't believe I've ever felt fear like that before in my life. His eyes were completely black, not to mention his very pale skin. I slammed the door in his face, locked and then deadbolted. This was definitely not my neighbor's son. I then proceeded to run back upstairs, right by the wife and lock the window, to see if he was gone. And he was, just like that, gone. I've barely gotten any sleep, and can't stop thinking about this, and just can't make sense of it. I've since stopped all research for obvious reasons, but I thought I would share this experience with you, and see if you guys have any thoughts on it. I want to share a story my dad has been telling my family for a long time. This took place in 2003, 15 years ago. We used to live in Mexico, more specifically, in Mexicali, Baja California. We lived in an urban area. This story is a bit different since he saw a woman instead of a child, but nonetheless, I'm sure it's the same thing. One afternoon after my father was doing his usual stuff, he heard knocking on the door. He quickly answered and was met with a Caucasian woman, a bit on the chubby side wearing some really old clothes that looked handmade and clearly weren't from this time period. She told him, Me da agua, senor? which translates to, can I have some water? My father replied with, there's a hose round the side. But the woman insisted on coming in. My father told her no. So she looked at him straight in the eyes. And that's where my dad saw it. Her eyes were completely black. She walked to the side of the house and proceeded to defecate on the sidewalk. My father lost track of her after that. And the next thing that happened was a bit strange. From that day onward for about a month, an owl would constantly fly and stand on the same place where she had done a duty. And that's all of the story. My father isn't usually a superstitious fellow, and even though it may sound a little bizarre, he's always told the same story. I didn't believe in black-eyed kids until just recently. Two of them came to my window. I live half underground and my window is at ground level right above my bed. It is storming pretty good and I had my blinds up watching the lightning and then suddenly two of them walked right up to the window like a horror movie and knocked, slowly but sternly. I shot out of bed drew the shade and heard them say, Please let us in. We're cold. Can we use your phone? Immediately I shouted for them to leave, but they didn't move. Recalling what I had read about them possibly being demons, I yelled as loudly as I could, Get away from here. Leave now. This is a house of God. Or something like that. I kept yelling, until the knocking stopped. I was scared out of my wits. And then finally one made eye contact through the crack in the shutters. And sure enough, its eyes were as black as could be. Like I was getting lost in the blackness and could not look away. And then they were gone. I'm honestly so terrified and shaking. I really wish I had never learned of these Satan spawns. This isn't my story per se, but is my mother's. My mother owns a salon in country suburbia, Philadelphia. I have been working for her since she opened, and I'm usually with her Wednesdays through Saturdays. Every Saturday, we have an older woman come in. We'll call her Ethel. Ethel usually washes her own hair, then sets it up to come and have it teased. It's literally a $4 service, and seems weird, but she's there every week for the same thing. I've never gotten a weird vibe from her, and have spent years talking to this woman. A few years ago I left work early with her closing up for the day. 
I felt safe knowing my mum only had one more client, and it would be no big deal. She's only there for a maximum of ten more minutes. As I get home, I get a call from my mother, who's shaken up, but not terrified. She goes on to tell me that she was doing Ethel's hair, and she uncharacteristically turned around and looked at my mum. When their eyes met, she said that they were completely black, no whites at all. And as my mum looked back into the mirror, her eyes were normal again. It hasn't happened again, and this was the first time I'd heard of it, and I honestly dismissed it for the most part, until I came across a humanoid encounter that led me to these stories. Now, I believe I will stay late just to see Ethel and speak to her.